Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Time About the Movies and welcome to the halfway point of 1989. We were at the 4th of July weekend, June 30th, 1989, and we've got three movies to look at today. Two that are not as memorable as most people would think, but one that is memorable, especially for me because it's one of my favorite movies of all time, but we'll get to that one when we get to that one. But let's begin with the biggest new release that came out this weekend and that was The Karate Kid Part 3. Yeah, coming off the last two Karate Kid movies, which were gigantic hits in 84 and 86, especially the last one, The Karate Kid Part 2, which actually made more money than its predecessor did, this was a major step down from the, from the previous two movies, largely because it basically just rehashed a lot of elements that the Karate Kid movies had already done beforehand. I mean, the main villains are basically the same guys from the first movie. Uh, the situations are basically the same thing from the, the last couple of movies. There's no real sense of danger in this one. Like in the Karate Kid Part 2, there was a legitimate sense of danger and intensity of whether or not uh, Dan uh, Daniel was going to actually go be able to get through what he was going through in that movie. But in this one, it just felt like they were just making a sequel to just make a sequel. It's a movie that suffers a lot from sequelitis. And, um... Yeah, everyone pretty much forgot about it, which I which is interesting because this mo because this is John D. Abelson who also directed Rocky, and Rocky V the next year would have kind of a similar impact, that the similar situation to what the Karate Kid Part Three had in terms of rehashing the same stuff from the previous movie, definitely being a major step down from the previous movies. But um, yeah, Karate Kid Part Three, it, it's a bad, it's not really a, it's, it's not really a bad movie, honestly, but. It's definitely a major step down from the last two movies. This is this is a movie that's just kind of, eh, but it suffers a lot from sequelitis. I mean, I would say it's the worst Karate Kid movie, but the next Karate Kid that came out five years later definitely would change that. But we'll get to that when we jump into 1994. So that's my thoughts on the Karate Kid Part Three. Let's move on to the next movie, and that is Dennis Quaid starring as Jerry Lee Lewis in the biopic Great Balls of Fire. Well, I mean, to the movie's credit, Dennis Quaid really gets into this role of Jerry Lee Lewis, and he's actually one of the best things about this movie, him and um, uh, Winona Ryder, but the rest of the movie itself is just kind of your typical generic biopic. They try to romanticize something contra more controversial than it should, that, that, that should have been presented here, but it's not really a ba it's not a bad movie, it's just mostly a forgettable movie. It's a movie that I think could have been done a whole lot better if they would but if they had just picked a simple route which that they wanted to go to, but other than that, though, this is a, just a pretty forgettable movie. The only thing that really makes it memorable is the fact that Dennis Quaid really gets into this role. He's really good in this movie, so is Winona Ryder. But other than that, though, it's just kind of a forgettable piece of 80s nostalgia, kind of. I mean, it's a gener it's about as generic of a biopic as you can get with, that's trying to be too safe, a little bit too marketable. But, um... I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, the only thing, like I said, the only thing I can really say about it is that I like Dennis Quaid as Jerry Lee Lewis. There's some great moments in here where he captures the spirit of Jerry Lee Lewis. And, uh, like I said, Winona Ryder. But other than that, that's about it. So we got the two lesser known movies out of the way. Now let's get to the movie that was not only one of the more influential movies of the year, one of the more, one of the best movies of the year. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, and that is Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Well, Spike Lee had directed two movies prior to this, uh, School Days and She's Gotta Have It. This is the movie that really put him on the map. This was the movie that garnered the most critical acclaim, the most, and considered is considered by many as one of the best movies of the decade, one of the best movies of all time, and it's also one of the most influential movies of its time. And like I said, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Like even nowadays, race is still such a touchy subject. Do the Right Thing manages to show that there's a problem with the way the world is and that there are ways to fix the problem if, they, if people actually took their time and of how to fix these problems. On top of that, Spike Lee, I think, does a great job mixing in a good strip, talking about the problems of the world and how our main characters cope with these problems and adding in this unique directing style that he would later use in his other movies. The dialogue feels very real. It's not afraid to speak the truth. It uses language that is common even to the world today. Like, you know, take the scene where Mookie and Pino are just talking over a machine and just having a conversation. It's fascinating to listen to, and it feels like an honest conversation that you would hear in real life. 
I like that Lee also creates very, very likable characters that can be seen in real life in this movie. In this film, there are no real bad guys or good guys. They're all regular people. Mookie is one of the film's strongest characters. Unlike other people, he thinks about things before he does them. He's aware of the problems in Brooklyn. And when he realizes that something bad is about to happen, he'll, as the title and one of the other characters played by Ozzie Davis says, puts it, do the right thing. The rest of the cast in this movie is great. You have Danny Aiello, Ozzie Davis, Ruby D, Bill Nunn, Rosie Perez, Giancarlo Esposito, John Turturro, uh, Samuel L. Jackson has a cameo in here, as does Robin Harris and Martin Lawrence. Uh, just a great cast coming together for this. I like the visual style that this movie also has. Right from the beginning of the movie, where you have the opening scene where Rosie Perez is dancing with the, during the opening credits, you can already tell you're in for something really special when it comes to this movie. I also like how the movie, it makes you question stuff. Like, it makes you question things that are going on in there, especially towards the end of the movie, which a lot of people even still question to this very day. There are still people that ask Spike Lee whether or not Mookie did the right thing or not, and I've gone on about what I thought about it. I personally felt like he was doing what he needed to do. Yes, you know, Mookie realizes that there will be no good in going in after Sal because... Of, if Sal and her sons had died, that would mean more trouble for the town and for the community. By throwing the trash can through the pizza shop window and luring the pe people to destroy the shop, he saves their lives, which in turn may have destroyed the pizza shop, but it saves their lives as well. It's like when the, a town has a huge tornado and your house is destroyed, but when you find that your family is alive, that makes up for it. A building can be re replaceable, but a life isn't. That's how I saw it. I thought Mookie did what he had to do, and, and in turn, I thought he did the right thing. That's just how I saw it, and I know a lot of people have theories about whether or not they still is if he did do the right thing. And like I said, even Spike Lee has had that question asked of him a number of times, but that's just my thinking about it. It could be not, it might not be what he was thinking, but that's just my theory about it. But either way you look at it, Do the Right Thing is a very important movie that still has a lot of subject matter that appeals to what we go through, to, what a lot of people go through today, and a great one as well. It provides a lot of entertainment value over a very touchy subject, mixes in great characters, a good story, a thrilling climax, and a really unique visual look that's just, it just, it stands the test of time. Like, it's still a movie that still holds up to this very day. It's still a powerful movie where the issues can still be looked at even today. It's a great movie. It's one of, it's Spike Lee's best movie, no question about it. It's also one of my favorite movies of all time. Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. That's one of those movies you have to see, man. You just gotta see it. And on that note, that's going to wrap up this edition of Time About the Movies as we continue past the halfway point of the year. We enter the month of July tomorrow. We got Lethal Weapon 2, which would end up becoming one of the biggest action hits of the year, as well as Weekend at Bernie's, one of the most unexpected movies of the year, and you might be surprised by it, honestly. And then we also have The Music Teacher, so three more movies to look at tomorrow, so thank you guys for watching, and as always, if you want to see more episodes like this, check out the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode I did, which was reviews of Batman and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and I'll see you guys tomorrow as we head into July of 1989. So thank you guys for watching, and as always, if you like what, and as always, uh, I'm about to say the thing again, and as always, I'll see you tomorrow, and until the next time I see you, take care. Good night, everybody.